Hey everybody, welcome to Take Off with John Clark presented by Live Casino Hotel Philadelphia. And we're counting down the days till the Eagles start their season in Detroit. We've got some good guests. Former Eagles great Brian Westbrook talking about the trade of Jalen Rager. And here's a good conversation with Eagles tight end Dallas Goddard. I think he had one of the best camps out of anybody on offense. He could have a really big year. Enjoy the conversations. All right, let's welcome in Eagles tight end Dallas Goddard. And Dallas, Eagles are still making moves. So when you look around at this locker room now and the talent you have out on the field, is this the most talent and well-rounded roster you've had since you've been here? Um, Yeah, definitely. You know, it's hard to say when I first got into the league, uh, getting drafted to the Super Bowl reigning champs, uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty full team, a pretty good team. Um, but yeah, like you said, I mean, the turnover has been unreal and the people we bring in, how he just has some up his sleeve at all times. Uh, you know, it's, it, it was an exciting off season, uh, for me, uh, just being on this team and seeing the players we're bringing in. And like you said, how he's still wheeling, dealing up until today. So, uh, you know, the better the people around me can be, the better I can be. So it's really exciting. Life in the NFL happens fast. Jalen Rager, two years ago, first round pick. How much do you think? The expectations weighed on him, and then the whole comparison to Justin Jefferson the whole time. Um, you know, it, it definitely probably had a little bit. Um, you know, he got brought in, and, you know, we're not running the same offense as Minnesota ran. You know, he didn't have the opportunities that maybe Justin Jefferson had. But, uh, you know, I think he's a tremendous player. I think he can be a very good player in this league. And, you know, like you said, the expectations, expectations are high for a first-round pick. And, uh, you know, if you don't reach those, especially in Philadelphia, it's – it's tough to go about it and, you know, do it. So I'm excited for him to have a new opportunity somewhere else. But, uh, you know, looking forward to Detroit and we got to keep building on that. So I'm from the Philly area in Delco. You're from South Dakota. What is it like adjusting to Philly? Because it's different for you, right? It's definitely different. You know, it's exciting. Uh, you know, when I first came out here, I was always excited to go back to South Dakota. But the longer I'm here, you know, this is becoming my home. And, you know, I love everything about Philadelphia, the sports town. Uh, the passion that these people have for the game that I love, the game that I get to play, uh, is pretty special. And you know, I can't wait to be in the link on uh, Monday night whenever we play the Vikings. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's pretty cool that this offense is basically back together, and then you add A.J. Brown. We've seen A.J. and Devontae out there in the practice field. Is there something you could tell us that maybe we don't see about A.J. and Devontae um, that makes them special or something? Yeah, I mean, what makes them special is that just like a lot of the people in the building, they love ball. Uh, you know, Schmitty gets done, he goes home and plays 2K or Madden, you yeah. know. Uh, AJ's the same way. They just, uh, the best part of their day is coming into the building and playing football. So anytime you have two people like that, uh, you know, it's going to be a problem for other teams. I'm seeing Smitty looks a little more swollen. He told us about that Wawa addiction. You know, he's, he's eating that every day. You know, I think AJ got him in there doing a few extra curls after. <laughs> but no, uh, I mean, Smitty's a special player. I've never seen him get covered. You know, I'm excited. He's on my team. I love watching him play, practice, all that. Same with AJ. So I think you and Smitty and, and Avante have something with Wawa going on. Do you also now have a Wawa addiction? Um, shoot, it's not bad as Smitty. I'm not there every day. I'm probably <laughs> like once every two or three. Um, but no, Wawa is the best place in the world. They got everything you need. Their hoagies are unbeatable. Shoot, they got the best coffee in the morning. It's they're the one stop one stop shop. So it's interesting because we've seen the tight ends, Brent Selleck. Zach Ertz and now Dallas Goddard. What's that evolution been like? And now that you're the guy since Zach is now in Arizona. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember being in high school, uh, looking up Brent Selig, watching his tape. And then when I got to college, you know, I, I was watching Zach's tape. So uh, I've been a fan of the Philadelphia tight ends ever since I was in high school. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad to be the next one here and hoping to, you know, they've been great for so long, hoping to keep that greatness up. And, you know, can't wait to keep doing it for a long time. Do you set personal goals for yourself? I mean, I, I see that you average close to 15 yards per catch. I mean, that's right up there with any tight end in the NFL. Do you set like Pro Bowl as a goal? Um, yeah, you know, obviously that's the next step in my career. I, I haven't got a Pro Bowl yet. I thought I've been close a few years where I could have been there, but I haven't. And, you know, that's ultimately a thing you want to do, be a Pro Bowl or all pro, things like that. Um, but for me, the things I care about really are, you know, when the quarterback throws me the ball that I make the catch. Um, that when I get the opportunity to make plays, I make them. Um, I don't really set goals as in terms of I want so many catches, so many yards. 
But when I get the opportunity to make those plays, I want to make sure I'm making them. I want a high completion percentage. I want a high yards after catch. You know, I care about that stuff like because, you know, you can't decide where the quarterback's going to throw the ball. You can't call the plays that get the ball thrown to you. So uh, whatever my job is uh, every day, every play, I just want to win at that play. When, when you add an A.J. Brown, how much more space do you think that all of you will have when you're operating out there? Yeah, um, you know, we're not 100% sure since we haven't had anybody game plan, but I'm hoping that the middle of the field is wide open and I could be running free a whole lot of games. That'd be, that'd be pretty sweet. When you look at the tight ends in the NFL, could you give me your top five tight ends? You study them? Yeah, I could definitely give you a top five. You know, I think there's the top five, you know, is kind of uh, unanimous, uh, you know, in no given order. But you got the Kelsey, the Kittle, the Waller. Uh, the Mark Andrews, myself, you know, if you want to throw Pitts in there, um, he gets a lot of hype. But, you know, those are kind of the five, six guys that I think are at the top. And anyone depend on uh, week by week how it goes, who could be the best. You had Gronk, uh, Travis Kelsey. I mean, do you set goals like I want to be the best damn tight end in the NFL? Yeah, for sure. Um, You know, coming out of college, uh, I had Zach right here and you know, I always looked up to him. He was the top three tight end for the beginning of my career. And, you know, just being with him every day, knowing what he could do, what I could do. Um, I've always looked at myself as an elite tight end. And, uh, you know, whether other people do it or not, it's definitely something I want to do. I want to be looked at as the best. Um, and, you know, that's just what I work towards every day. Nick Sirianni talks about connection all the time. And Jalen Hurts, guys tell me he invites them over for dinners, one-on-one dinners, gets to know all you guys. How big was it in the off season? when you spent different, you know, different cities you went to, to hang with Jalen, work out with him and all that? Yeah, you know, just to get to know a little bit more, you know, you can only learn so much about somebody in the building. You ask questions about football. Uh, but, you know, when you get that one-on-one time, you start talking about your personal feelings, your personal life, uh, stuff like that. And, you know, that connection is really what makes you play a little bit harder when it comes game on the line. Shoot, I don't really know this guy. Maybe I'll only give 99%. But when you know somebody, you care about them, shoot, you're going to go above and beyond for that guy. And, you know, Jalen knows that. That's why he does what he does. And I know that. That's why I do what I do. You know, anytime you can build it, whether it's the O-line, uh, tight ends, wide receivers, the closer you are with everybody, the more they're going to give for you. When you got a play call and they have to clear it out, they're going to dig a little bit harder to clear it out. Uh, and I want the same thing. If it's a wide receiver screen, I want them to know that the guy that I have to block isn't going to be on the play. And, uh, you know, when you care about people like that, it just elevates everybody for sure. Speaking of connections, you and Avante Maddox, big connection, live together, first four years. Now, what is this, a little separation? It's time to move out? It's a little separation. Uh, you know, I still see him quite a bit. He, we live pretty close, so every morning his car's in my driveway, and then he just comes knocks on my door. We get in, and one of us drives to work. Uh, so we stay pretty close. Uh, that's a bond that's going to be tough to break, and, you know, I'm glad he's got a few more years here with me. Uh, you know, still going to be good friends. So you live together. You decided it was time. Maybe you got to move out, but you live right next door to each other now. I mean, it's a uh, we're we're in the same neighborhood. We're yeah. three minutes apart. Uh, you know, he bought his house first, and uh, you know, I had a definitely a little radius, a diameter that I searched for. Uh, lucky enough that I found one real close, and you know, it's just perfect since we're such good friends. Uh, you know, anytime we don't have anything else to do, we can go hang out at each other's house, and you know, we're always right next door. So last year when I was interviewing him, I asked for his two pet peeves about you because we've all had roommates, a yep. little something, something. Can you guess what he said bothered him a little bit in a fun way about you? I'm going to say he thought I was dirty. <laughs> and then, shoot, I don't even know what the second one is. But all I know is that he thinks I'm dirty because he's got to pick up after me a little right. bit. And, man, I was taking his dishes in all the time. You know, I was making the food, delivering it to him, cleaning the dishes. Shoot, I leave one wrapper behind and he calls me dirty. Right. You know, it's it's all uh, it's all good though. You know, I love living with him. It was fun. We had a lot of good times. That is what he said. He said like, you'll, you'll drink something or you'll eat something and, and it's done. You just put it on the counter. You don't throw it away. So you got that one. The other one, he said, even if you're wrong, you always have to be right. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. He was just more upset that I'm always right. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I get to argue with him and, you know, I can always, I, I'm really good at uh, persuading people and turning what I believe into what they believe. So I definitely did that quite a bit and he's hard headed too. He's the same way. He's not going to believe me or ever admit <laughs> he's wrong. So, well, you got those pretty good. So uh, is there anything that like a pet peeve about Avante that like just got to you a little bit? Um, 
You know, my biggest pet peeve with Avante is that he didn't like sleep nearly as much as I do. You know, he's kind of one of those persons that goes to bed at midnight, wakes up at 6 a.m. every day. You know, he only needs the six. Or me, it's like I need eight plus. Like I'm thinking 10, you know, 1030 comes around. I'm like, yo, I'm going to head to bed. He's like, what do you mean? It's early. It's like not even midnight. I'm like, no, man, I got to go to bed. He wakes up knocking on my door. I'm like, bro, let me sleep a little bit. You know, like the Wawa commercial, he wakes me up. My friends are coming over. I don't care. They're not here yet. Let me sleep. Uh, but no, it was like I said, I love living with Devontae. I can't say there's too much I disliked about it. When you have a good amount of sleep, it improves your quality of life. Am I right? I agree, man. I think yeah. I think sleep is one of my favorite things. If I'm not playing football, there's nothing I'd rather be doing than sleeping. I love it. Uh, speaking of your quarterback, Jalen Hurts, guys have said he's improved in preseason training camp, making faster decisions, the reads and everything. Have you seen that? What else have you seen with Jalen in his second year in this offense under Nick? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, just the second year offense, I think this is the first time he's had the same offensive quarter coordinator two years in a row since – Shoot, I think before college, I don't even I think know. Think he if said we, his dad in high school. I don't even know if we had offensive coordinators in high school in Britain, but <laughs> I know we didn't have too many plays. Right, you had nine on nine, right? So how many coaches did you? You have? know, probably one, <laughs> one on each side, maybe of the ball. But no, uh, yeah, he's definitely improved. You know, just being in the same system, seeing the same things. Uh, he's definitely gotten better, and you know, we're playing to his strengths, finding what the receivers can do best, what I can do best, and trying to put us in those spots and. Uh, like you said, he's going through his reads. He looks really good. He looks smart when he's making his decisions. He's confident in them. He throws the ball where it needs to be. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to watching him play this year. I think he's going to have a tremendous year. And do you think going into second year with Nick Sirianni that that you can basically add some things? I mean, a couple of the coaches hinted, yeah, there's going to be some new wrinkles. Do you think, like, there's a comfort level now so you can add some stuff as well? Yeah, without a doubt. You know, it was all the coaches' first time in this building uh, trying to figure out what I do, you know, they, when me and Zach were here, I didn't get to do as much in the route game. And, you know, we were kind of limited in that aspect. And the more that they've been here, the more that they've given people opportunities. Why don't we try to put the Y on that route and the X on this route? And what if we put Schmitty over here and Quez over there and AJ over here and Dallas, you know, we're just moving people around and seeing what people can do, where they can get open. And, um, you know, we're just going to keep building on what uh, the players can do well. And, uh, where Jalen likes to go with it and what he wants to do. Uh, we're just going to formation it to make it hard on the defenses. How much does your defense and some of the matchups you have in that secondary and everything help you guys every day in practice? Oh, it, it helps tremendously. You know, like they say, iron sharpens iron. And shoot, the receivers get to go against two of the best in the league every day with uh, Slay and James. And then uh, me going against the safeties. We got great safeties. Um, you know, blocking some of the best DNs, which I feel in the league. Uh, day in and day out it makes all of us better so uh, like I said iron sharpens iron and I'm blessed to be on a team with this much talent Uh, just forces you to get better each and every day you know you can't beat them on the same move every time so you just gotta put more tools in your tool bag and work on different things and see what it does and how it affects the defense and you know I think it's just gonna uh, elevate our level of play each and every day. I've seen Nick Sirianni wearing some shirts of the players have I seen a Dallas Goddard shirt yet I mean is there one out there? Uh, you know, I don't know if he's wore it yet, but uh, he said that he's got a couple uh, of me. He must be waiting until, uh, actually, I don't know when they're going to come out, but maybe after my first big game. <laughs> How much involvement do you have? I remember A.J. Brown, when he first got here, he said he's even looking at plays that he sees on Instagram, and he's, like, talking to the coaches. Hey, can we can we get this involved in the offense? Do you suggest plays? Do you kind of run some things by the coaches? Um, You know, I can't say I've ever really banged the door uh, trying to get the ball. Um. You know, I just go out there and try to put wins on tape and, uh, you know, hope that the coaches can see that, you know, they can't take me out the field, that they can put me anywhere. Uh, you know, I talk to my position coach. I say, man, where are the targets? We need more targets. Why yeah. Why aren't we a primary here? You know, I, and he's always banging the door for me. I know that. Um, but, you know, I don't want to play the politics game too much. I just want to go out there, have fun, and, you know, do everything that I can at a very high level and, you know, hope hope that the coaches see it and be like, 88 needs the ball this time. 88, maybe we need to throw in the ball a little bit more. Don't forget about the tight ends, right? You can't forget about the tight ends, right. man. Best position in the game for sure. Before we wrap this up, um, a lot of people have said you've had a great camp. Is there somebody you've seen, whether it's offense or defense, where you're like, wow, this guy's really got it going on. He's going to have a great year. Man, you make it tough. Uh, probably the biggest improvement I've seen since I've been here is the linebacker core. 
I think we got a good group uh, from bottom to top. You know, Nicobe coming in, he started making plays. Uh, Kazir White, you know, he came in right away and started giving us a little bit of problems. You know, he's a really smart football player. TJ, he's been lights out. You know, he's been he's always flying to the ball. Uh, you saw that last year that he just kept climbing his way until he got the starting job. And he wasn't going to let anybody take that away this year. But I think the linebackers are going to have a big year. Um, but like I said, it was a fun camp. It was a fun camp, and, uh, you know, a lot of players played well and, you know, uh, looking forward to big things from a lot of people. And let's end on this. Uh, so is it true? I mean, I think I heard this before, but your dad was a big Cowboys fan. Yep. And Dallas is literally, you're named after the Dallas Cowboys. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, I got a little brother named DeMarcus after DeMarcus Ware. You know, my dad was a big Cowboys fan. Uh, I was smart enough. Shoot, it must have been like the age of seven I decided Forget the Dallas, Dallas Cowboys. I'm not a fan of them. I, I went to the Packers, you know, so I started making my way over here. And, a winner. You know, now now I'm glad to be an Eagle, Eagles fan. F the Cowboys, F all the rest of the <laughs> East, but, you know, go Birds. I love it. I mean, a Dallas and Philly that you can actually like. Yes. You know, That's pretty cool. We needed one. Yeah. We needed one. Appreciate the time and best of success this year, Dallas. Yes, thank you. All right, and let's welcome in Eagles great Brian Westbrook. And it's always great to catch up with you, Brian. you got a lot of things going on. How are you? I'm doing well, John, doing well. It's, it's almost NFL football season, and, you know, things are moving along. Yeah, and Brian is the new XFL Director of Player Engagement. That's really cool. I, I first want to ask you, we're going to get into that. I first want to ask you about the news with the Eagles that they traded Jalen Rager and how he got two – late round draft picks for Jalen. Do you think a change of scenery was best here for everybody? Well, I think we saw Jalen not being able to produce up to his level. I mean, I think being a first round pick, uh, the expectation is that you produce like a first round pick. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to get that done here in Philadelphia. And so now he moves on to a different place and a fresh start. And for so many young guys, a fresh start is exactly what they need to try to uh, find their way, and hopefully things work out for Jalen. Do you think that it really was in his head a lot, especially the comparisons with Justin Jefferson the whole time? And and Jalen admitted he got on social media and saw what people were saying about him. Well, you know, fortunately for me, I, you know, back in the day, we didn't have as much social media presence, and we didn't have to worry about as much. We were worried about what was being said in the newspapers, and now – uh, these young men have to deal with social media and having fans have access, media having access and the pressure of the, really defending themselves and being a part of this world that's outside of the game. And some of these young guys just can't get over that fact. And especially when you're not doing well and the expectations were so high, um, it's really difficult. And I think Jalen probably got in his own way by reading his own press clippings and uh, responding to to social media and things like that. And, and that happens. That's what happens with some of these young guys and they can't get away from it. And it adds uh, more pressure, more pressure and, and more, uh, you know, th more, more importance for them to go out there and deliver. And unfortunately he did not deliver um, here in Philadelphia and now he's on his way to a different place. So of course, how he pulled off another trade trading for the safety Chauncey Gardner Johnson when you look at this roster in its entirety now, Brian, when you go into this season with this roster, what are your expectations? Where do you think the Eagles rank in the NFC hierarchy right now? Well, much improved roster. And, you know, we've seen it before. We've seen teams that look great on paper that just don't perform well. Um, I think this team on paper looks very good, looks very competitive, one of the better teams in the NFC, um, certainly the best team in the NFC East on paper. Now, we have to understand injuries happen. We have to understand chemistry matters on, on football teams, on um, sport teams in general. They have to be able to go out there and uh, play together and play injury-free for the most part. Have your key guys there in the key games, in the key moments. And then you're going to have to have those guys step up in those key moments. And so uh, it, it's not just a paper game. They have to go out there and perform on the field. But when you look on paper, there's not very many teams better than the Eagles in the NFC. How about the Cowboys? They're uh, they're bringing in your uh, your left tackle, Jason Peters, for a visit. Um, Jason Peters coming in for a visit for the Cowboys. The Cowboys have some injuries; they lost some players. Do you think the Eagles are the favorites in the division now? Well, no, there's no doubt in my mind that the Eagles are the favorite in the division. Um, they, they have the best team. They have the best roster. You know what they were able to do last year, even with a a 
first time starter for like the regular season quarterback with Jalen Hurts that was figuring his way out, getting better every single week. Um, they still were able to win nine games. Now you have better targets on the outside when you talk about the offensive side of things. You, you have a much better and improved defense. And so I, I just think that all around the roster is better. The team is better. I think the chemistry will be better. Second year for Nick Sirianni. This team has a great opportunity to go far. Now, that means getting into the playoffs. That means winning a few playoff games. We'll see how far they can go, depending on how well they they mesh during the regular season and how much growth you see from the quarterback. That's going to that's going to really determine how far you go in the in the postseason. Do you think we will see enough growth from Jalen Hurts, especially with the talent that he's got around him? You know, we can all speculate. I think we can all speculate and try to try to say Jalen is this, Jalen is that. I, I know from seeing Jalen a few times over the summer that he has put in all the work that he possibly can uh, to become a better passer, to become a more consistent passer, to help this team be in a position um, that he can help them be successful. I, I, I have no doubt that he's put in the work. Really, you don't know these things until you see him play 11 on the 11th with, with, with real a team on the other side in a real live game. Um, whether he can pass that test. Is he going to be good enough to carry this football team? He's put the work in. There's no doubt about that. Now he has to go out there and prove it on Sundays, um, not in the preseason, but on Sundays, not on the practice field, but on Sundays. If he can do that, um, I think the sky's the limit for this team. So you have a new title, XFL Director of Player Engagement. Am I right? Uh, How did this come about? Well, ironically enough, Mark Ross, who is the director of player operations over the XFL. He was a guy that was in head of college scouting at the Eagles when I left out of Villanova. So we had a a great relationship. Then he was with the Eagles for a few years while I was there. Then I think he went up to New York. And so we've stayed in contact. Um, He was, he was starting his new position over there as director of operation with the XFL. And he saw what I was doing. He was seeing that I was working with uh, entrepreneurs, with businesses, trying to help, Um, allow our our retired players the ease of transition from their playing days to the next part of their life. And that's kind of what the XFL is all about. They want to make sure that our players have access to to pathways of success while they're a player, as well as after they're a player. And and part of that is financial literacy. Part of that is education. Part of that is uh, connecting them with mentors and connecting the dots so they can be successful, just as successful off the field as they are on the field. And and that's what the position is all about. How rewarding is something like this for you? Because you playing in the NFL for as long as you did, I'm sure you've seen and and heard the stories of guys who, you know, have trouble when their career is over. And and, uh, it it can be tough. It can be very tough. And I think a lot of guys go through identity foreclosure. You've known yourself as a football player for so long, and then the game is taken away. And some guys is earlier, some guys is a little bit later. You have to have something to fall back on. You have to have an education, a skill set, something to fall back on. We want to make sure that all these guys have something to fall back on so that they can be successful in life. This football game is just a short period, but I want you to be successful in life ongoing. And that's what we're here to try to enhance and make sure that we can develop these guys well enough uh, so that they can be prepared when this football game is over. And, you know, uh, speaking of the Eagles, you know all about the running back position. Uh, Miles Sanders has missed a lot of time here in camp with a hamstring issue, but we hear that he's going to be okay for the start of the regular season. It's it's like, hey, why put him out there? Why worsen the hamstring? But is that a concern with Miles and their entire running back situation when when he has had injuries, it seems like, each year? Well, I think it is a concern. Anytime you have a hamstring, that's always a concern. Those hamstrings seem to linger. I remember when I was in San Francisco and I had a hamstring early in the season. Fortunately, I didn't, I didn't get the opportunity to play very much, but I know that it did linger for quite some time. Uh, Miles is much younger, much more healthy than I was at that point. So I, I hope he's able to come back and be healthy but, but I also know that Boston Scott, I know Kenneth Gainwell are, are two players that they trust and that they, they, they have a great understanding of the offense. But you still need that guy, Miles Sanders. You still need his skill set, his game-breaking speed, his ability to catch the ball like he did his, his rookie year, catch the ball out of the backfield. He has the ability to be a, a really good running back in the NFL. Now he needs to go out there and stay healthy, but also prove to himself and others that he can be that guy. And, and listen, 
when you're in your contract year, nobody wants it more than you. And so I expect big things from Miles Sanders throughout this season. How much do you think the Eagles offense is going to open up and, and maybe more space when you have an A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard with that offensive line? I mean, how much do you think these guys are going to be able to operate? Well, I just know how the game changed for me when you bring in T.O. Defenses are saying, okay, I have a cornerback over there. I need a safety over there, too. That takes an extra man out of the box. You add the second year of uh, Devontae Smith. You add a Pro Bowl player in A.J. Brown. You add Dallas Goddard, who just, I think, over the last four or five games last year, just continued to develop and get better and better. Now you have something offensively that is scary, especially in the pass game. And if you're a defense, you're thinking about the quarterback running as well. That's going to open up lanes and holes for Miles Sanders that I think he'll be able to exploit. But when you look at this offense with the great offensive line that Jeff Stoutland continues to put out there, they're a football team that you have to be aware of, that you have to be cautious of because they can beat you deep. They can throw the ball underneath. And these guys are good enough with the ball in their hands to beat you with the running catch. They have the ability to run the ball down your throat. With that, that means options. That means the defense has to be, you know, aware of so many different things. That's a great place to be when you talk about an offensive side of the football. And so they, they have the potential. Now you have to go out there and do it on Sundays, and they'll start in a week or so against Detroit. What do you think of the job Howie Roseman has done? Now, obviously, you're trading away Jalen Rager, and they cu- they sent J.J. Ortega-Whiteside to Seattle. So you're, you're basically saying, hey, we made mistakes on those, but they've recovered tremendously and it seems like he's always able to pull off these deals, these types of deals, uh, when you least expect it, like A.J. Brown on draft night. Well, I think Howie's done a great job of, of moving some pieces around. I mean, when you talk about a first round and second round pick, you want something in return um, for those types of picks. I mean, getting a seventh round, sixth round pick, that's not necessarily the type of compensation that you want. But getting something for players that were not producing, that is something. So that that is significant there. Um, I think – just like any GM and president, they want those guys that you draft to go out there and put in work. They want those guys to produce. Unfortunately, Ortega Whiteside, as well as Rager, they did not produce. And now Howie is kind of left with his hands tied to try to make a deal. And I think he's done the best as he can uh, making deals with teams that that are willing to try to take um, someone that is not working in your city and try to make something out of them. And certainly there's talent there. Um, they just have not shown it on the NFL level. And is this a great example of when you have a young quarterback on a rookie contract, you have so much more money to play with? Well, that's what you want. You want to you want to win while your your quarterback's in that rookie contract. That's what you want to do. Ideally, I think that's what they did out there in Kansas City. Then obviously, you pay Patrick Mahomes. He becomes the Patrick Mahomes that we all know and love. But if you can find a way to win with a young quarterback on a rookie contract, you do have a lot more flexibility, uh, the ability to go out there and make these types of deals, spend money in different areas. Uh, We all know that if you have a quarterback that can win, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Uh, Right now, we don't have that issue because Jalen Jalen Hurts is still in that rookie contract. But uh, it's just a matter of time. If he goes out there and balls out this year, at some point, he's going to be looking for money in his pocket. Exactly right. By the way, I mean, you've got the XFL job now. And uh, how's that book going? The the children's book? <laughs> yes, there it is. I don't know if you can see it. Maybe backwards. Yeah. The, mouse that, the mouse who plays football um, is, is going really, really well. We're super excited. Uh, Leslie Van Arsdal and Emma and I, so we put this book together. People love it. It's a, it's a book about character. It's about believing in yourself. It's about believing that even though people – think that this is a weakness. Um, it can be your strength, turning those things into strengths. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book that's about inspiration. Um, most importantly for us, we're reading this to our kids. We're giving these messages to our kids. We're also putting the money where our mouth is. 50% of the proceeds from this book will go directly to children's charities. So we're not, a, we're not about making money. We're about leaving a legacy through our words, but also through our dollars and cents. Uh, so anyone out there, uh, please go to Barnes and Nobles, We've had some issues with Amazon trying to get some books in, but Barnes and Nobles and Temple University Press has the books available. They'll get it to you as soon as possible. Um, But again, you're helping a good cause as far as charities with 50 percent of the proceeds going to charity, but also a really good message inside this book here. There we go. Let's see that one more time. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like that. 
Did you help design that there? Well, listen, 36, obviously the number in, in Philadelphia, and I don't know if it's backwards, but also 20, my, my Villanova number. So there's some, there's some things in this book that you'll see um, that are homage to our, our great city of Philadelphia, certainly Villanova as well, a couple of coaches that you may recognize. And so exciting times inside of this book. That's great. Well, hey, we wish you the best of success. We've we've always thought you're just a tremendous story. We followed you from Villanova. Uh, what a, what a great story you've always been, and uh, glad you're able to share it now. The children's book, and then also with all these players in the XFL with your new job. So appreciate the time, B. West. Thanks so much, John. Take care. <laughs>